fantastic. So, friends, colleagues, welcome guests. Um, good evening. Um, I'm Professor Deborah Johnston. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor here at London South Bank University. Um, and I have the lovely job of welcoming you and of giving the formal introduction for the inaugural lecture of Professor Eddie Chaplin. When I do that, one of the things I always say with a big group of people, I have got a stammer, I will get stuck on words, and you know it will all be okay. So it will all be okay. Um, I have to give that traditional introduction to any face-to-face -face meeting. So it is, please can you make sure your phones are switched off, but do be tweeting and posting, that's, that's all fine. Um, we will be recording this evening's event, so please do keep that in mind. The camera is over here. Um, the toilets are, are just outside, so if you go out, they are signposted. We are not expecting a fire alarm test, so if the alarms do go off, please make your way following the fire exit signs, either at the bottom or at the top. Um, I spoke to Eddie about this bef um, at the start, and we thought just to make it an even more inclusive, a, an even more friendly and welcoming atmosphere, we would be really grateful if people could, rather than um, clap, if you could indicate just with um, the visual sign here. So we would really appreciate that. We know people will forget. Don't worry if you do, but please try to, um, to adopt this. And we also keep in mind that for some people, it's very bright in here. There's a lot of noise. If anybody wants to, there is a space just across the corridor, the Southwark Lecture Theatre. You're very welcome to go into that space. It's got a very nice, soft um, environment, and it might be a good place for anyone who would um, like that kind of space at some point in the evening. So, before I formally introduce Professor Chaplin, I wanted to say something about the nature of an inaugural lecture. So, because for some of you, it might be your first time here. So, what is an, an, an inaugural lecture? It is a moment of real joy for the university. Um, it's an important m m milestone in the career of a full professor. It's that first opportunity to formally present to, um, to, um, to your peers um, the body of work, the journey that you have been on. And it's a wonderful moment to bring in new people, to bring in students, new collaborators, members of the general public, to bring them in and to take them on that um, intellectual journey, that impact journey that, um, that, um, that, um, that you've been on. It's great for the school in which the professor is located. It brings people in. It brings in staff members. It's a great chance for us to get together and to speak and to debate in a way that we don't always have. Um, and it's fantastic for the university because it's our opportunity to invite people in, to, in, to um, invite in members of the general public, to invite our, our current students, to invite former students in, and to really see what the value is of the teaching and the research that we do here. So, we will hear this evening much more about Eddie's journey, his journey, and the things that have propelled him with his particular contribution. Um, Eddie will be well known to many of you, and I know that tonight he's joined by special guests, by a, by a large number of special guests, I've already been told I couldn't list them all because we'd be here all night, but I will name a few. So, by his, uh, so he's joined here by his wife, Lisa, by some of his current collaborators. So Jane McCarthy, Peter Cronin, yeah, that's right. and, and um, Steve Hardy. And of course, by a, a, a wider range of um, current and former colleagues and students. So welcome to all of you. Before I ask Professor Chaplin to give his inaugural lecture, and at the risk of causing him some embarrassment, I will just share a little about Eddie. So Eddie is Professor of Mental Health in Neurodevelopmental Conditions here at LSBU. 
He's been instrumental in setting up and developing both local and um, national mental health services for people with intellectual disability and, or, and, and autistic adults, both within the NHS and the criminal justice system. Former LSBU professor, friend and colleague, Professor Sally Hardy, who's now the Dean of Nursing at the University of East Anglia, once described Eddie as, and I'm quoting here, <laughs> okay, Eddie is a brain on a stick, one of the brightest, nicest people you will ever work with. We're going to hold that memory uh, with us afterwards. Um, Professor Chaplin has also been involved in, in mental health training and peer mentoring via co-production with people with intellectual disability and autistic adults. He's currently head of the Scientific Committee of the European Association of Mental Health and Intellectual Disabilities. And he's edited the, the, um, the journals Advances in Autism and Advances in Health in Intellectual Disabilities. He's also published a number of books with Pavilion Publishing. You might have seen their desk outside, and so they've joined us here this evening. So, special guests, colleagues, please welcome Professor Eddie Chaplin with his inaugural lecture entitled Mental Health Care in Intellectual Disabilities and Autism. Hi everyone, thank you, and thank you Sally, I've never been called a stick before, <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, so let's use the imagination before we start. <laughs> You're a bit squashed, Peter's a bit, do you want to go somewhere else? Yeah, all right, Peter's going to adjust himself while we start. Whoops, wrong way. As you can see, I um, do a lot of teaching. <laughs> right, so what to expect today? I'm going to go into the early career, a bit around starting research, and that comes around sharing clinical practice. It's not actually what you might consider outputs all the way. Then more about contributing to the evidence base, looking out a career in research, and the final part is working together in collaboration for co-production. Now, before I kind of start, yesterday I was at 160 slides. Don't worry, they've been cut down. <laughs> <laughs> and people like Jane would... Uh, people say I overthink things sometimes. But <laughs> we've got there, and one of my colleagues very supportively said, what have you put down since you were four? So, embarrassingly, the next slide is <laughs> Little Ed the Mod. Age four. No cloth buttons or <laughs> side pocket. But yeah, that was me. So I've shortened this bit quite a lot. Because <laughs> it doesn't have that much kind of relevance. So early career. Started in 4th of January 1982 at Cane Hill Hospital School of Nursing. Joined the Index of Student Nurses. Here's the old... Asylum. This is typically what was called a day room, um, and you'll still see old mental health nurses refer to their lounges at home as day rooms. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it was the institutionalisation bit was as much the staff as other people. And at the time, it was 40 wards, um, most of them open, all apart from one, which is very different to today. We think that we've kind of reinvented got better, but there was more freedom in some respects. So, that was me. <laughs> Here's Ed the Revolutionary. <laughs> I know why you are laughing. So I used to wear a blue sapphire and a red garnet earring in each year. And you, with the hoop and the stud, went for a different bit. But there we are, and this is where I... So, sharing clinical practice. Right, a little bit about 
neurodevelopmental conditions. The title is intellectual disabilities, but I'm going to get rid of that. We're going to call it learning disabilities. Intellectual disabilities is great for publishing. It's a standard language. Everyone knows what you're talking about worldwide. But the people I kind of work with day in, day out, don't like the term. There's been too many offensive terms done. So we it's use... People, that's it? right, Pete. So we use learning disabilities. Yeah. So saying that, I may slip, but learning disabilities, autism, ADHD, are part of this group of neurodevelopmental conditions, which really kind of affects brain development. And people may have some kind of delay, difficulties in learning, social situations, communication. And that's just a very brief overview because we could be here all day. But neurodevelopmental conditions affect 15% of the European population. Autism, about 0.8 to 1% of populations. Men are four to five times more likely to have it versus females. It's kind of watched this space because historically, women have found it very difficult to get a diagnosis and often missed. So these are all subject to change. Prevalence of learning disabilities, anything from 0.4 to 3%. And some of this can depend more on what the criteria is used to measure it or to do a diagnosis. We have different diagnostic instruments, whether in North America or Europe. So globally, 115 have a learning disability, ADHD, 0.5 to 2% across countries. And again, it's more prevalent in male, whereas learning disabilities is more even split. Autism in people with learning disabilities, 50 to 80%, and autism in ADHD, 20 to 85%. So caution there, you can see the range of figures. You know, you're going to get other quoted. So it's one of those where nobody's wrong but <laughs> it's what they've reported. Right. Before we start here, we going back to 1987, I've left the asylum. I'm in the Mental Impairment Evaluation and Treatment Service. It's a regional unit which was part of the movement out of the large asylums, and it was for people with learning disabilities and mental health problems and challenging behaviour who couldn't quite make it into the community at that time because the support needs weren't covered. So we did that, and at the time, the local services used the mental health and learning disability model. Usually, mental health care would have been done by the community learning disability teams. But this redefined it and made it a mental health specialism. And that was the thing. And it was in its same right as forensic, rehab, substance use, and it builds the body and the CDLT was used for more physical care or other support needs. Now, the bit at the bottom, the SDR training, research and development, is where I worked after the MIT. And this is almost unique, I think, to the day, where you've got a local service that has its own research centre. You've got services that have their own ethics committees before you even look at the scrutiny going. It's so far above its time and it still hasn't caught up a lot of places. But that's that. The book on the end is by Professor Nick Burris, and he charts the whole history of around 40 years. He truly is one of the pioneers worldwide of this speciality. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about him a bit later on. So... Assessment challenges, do we need specialist services? Well, valuing people, the white paper that come out and valuing people now, feels people should be going into generic services. So ordinary adult mental health services where there's a crisis. So why do we have these specialist services? So well, some of the issues is people have difficulty understanding emotions, recognising or identifying their feelings, also describing experiences, there's diagnostic overshadowing where somebody will go to their doctor and they say, there's nothing wrong with you, that's because you've got a learning disability. <coughs> there's also the issue of retaining information, acquiescence, answering yes, trying to please, trying not to look out of place, not trying to look odd. There's also suggestibility, 
where it's, again, it's one of those. Are you happy or sad? Sad. Are you sad or happy? Happy. It's what people think they want to. And these are things that you won't pick up straight away. It's kind of having the feel knowing. There's also poor reduced cognitive ability. This can be seen in concentration, memory, planning, problem solving. And also remember, this group has some kind of poverty experience. They're asked for stuff in life. And what you'll find is sometimes symptoms aren't as complex, so can easily be missed, particularly delusions. And we kind of call that psychosocial masking. Now, how do we help? A lot of it sounds simple, but it's a bit more difficult than you think in practice. So engage people in a way they understand what the treatment is, how it can benefit people. Keep speech simple, jargon free, one thing at a time. If I talk to someone and I've got three points in a sentence, and they go, yeah, that sounds good. The risk is they've shut off at the end of the first one. And so I think yes to all three, but no. So point by point, make it simple, make sure you're doing, because it's no good. You can spend all the time you want, but if your assessment's not right, it's going to be wrong. Now, this one upsets loads of people. The amount of people that go to the doctor's surgery and they'll say, what's wrong with him? What's wrong with her? And you'll know that. So talk to the person. But that's not to say don't involve their family. But remember, it is a person. You need consent. You need to get people, really, to be on board. You want the whole family. We're looking at circles of support. We're looking to put networks around people. So it's not a way of excluding people, but you know, just be polite. Um, also, how you use information, adapt it. It could be visual prompts, easy read, etc. There's various ways of doing it. Now, <coughs> before I ever wrote anything, and this was on the mites unit, and we wanted to know if our practice was effective. So this is evidence-based practice on a real micro kind of level. So this is a case note review. Everyone's got a learning disability, but we've also separated the people who've got autism and a learning disability. So this is for illustration rather than, you can't read anything into this. This is just what we looked at to see what we were doing. So we've got 21 versus 24. Now, we compared both groups, the controls who just had the learning disability, and what we found was most of the autistic individuals came from uh, accommodation Mr. from was hospital, whereas the people with just learning disability, a number were from prison coming. Now, doesn't sound remarkable at the moment, What a time to break, eh? <laughs> oh, yeah, here we are. <laughs> then we looked at what were the referral questions for the two groups. For the autistic group, a lot of their issues stem from aggression to others, whereas the people with intellectual disability, the safety risk, it may not have been that it was sec what they would call in those days sexually challenging behaviour. So some of these slides are from the time, so I'll make, you know, let people know if they think, oh, that sounds a bit offensive, or that's not PC. I've never been PC, but I do try. <laughs> <laughs> so duration of stay, we found the autistic group stayed two months longer. But outcomes, this was good. The majority went back to the community, whereas the learned disability group, there was more different disposals. So what we kind of do get a sense from there is that, well, that extra two months is worth the output, is worth the benefit. We know having this extra layer of complexity to someone's condition does make it. And this is when we get back to specialist services. The reason we have them is for the people who revolve in door. 
the people who present differently to others in terms of their mental health needs. It's people that general psychiatrists really won't have much of a clue about or they've come to the end of their knowledge. So this is why the need for specialist services. First publication. This was at the mites as well, assessment and treatment of fire setting. And this was one of the first things that used a cognitive behavioral framework in people with learning disabilities and offenders. And it's still one, still used in a lot of kind of psychology things. You can see by the, it's making me nostalgic, Herschel Prinz and people like that, you know, <laughs> in the early days. But this is about a young chap who come from Rampton, who set fires, and it just describes the treatment program to um, help him. What did I do next? Well, I did a quick MSc, and then I come here. But it wasn't here then. I was a lecturer practitioner at the old South Bank University, now London South Bank, and was the program director for the um, MSc in psychiatric intensive care. So we're going on this list, how we're building up stuff. And then back to the Estia Centre. So we've got Steve, me and Karina, that's three iterations of people who headed the centre. Um, but the Estia Centre, as well as doing the training, local training, clinical research, publications, journals, it was also a great training environment. So, whoops. Uh. <laughs> so these are some of the books that um, have edited. These are all pavilion apart from this one here, which Steve led on. And this was the first mental health nursing guidance for people with learning disabilities. Since we're not as clinically active as we once were, the publication goes on, but other people update it. But that was the first iteration. We've done offending, um, autism spectrum conditions, a guide with Steve. Now, the news for this one is we're going to do a second edition, and this is quite clinically focused. There is other stuff from carers, but it's the odd chapter here and there. The next edition, which I'm doing with Professor Nikki Martin and Steve, we're going to have a lot more contribution from the autistic community. And the aim is really to have it half and half. We're not going to let either group overpower it, but, but to do that. <coughs> Guided self-help, I'll come back to that one. And since I've been here at South Bank, um, oops, go. Oh. <laughs> Just too eager. Um, Learning Disability Today, which was originally written by Steve Carnaby. We was, uh, I was asked to do the fourth edition. And the thing I like about this is that the whole of the Learning Disability team here at London South Bank were editors. So in the audience, we have Rene, we have Joe and Jill, who also contributed to it. And to that, it was good because it is one of their kind of flagship publications. It's the kind of entry level for people who want to know more about the area. Different types of books. These are more heavy, more academic. Um, and both with Jane. The first one is usually these books you'll see as a chapter. These are the first kind of books at this level. So we've got a clinician's guide to mental health conditions in adults with autism spectrum disorders and forensic aspects of neurodevelopmental disorders. And this is just in the proofing stage at the moment and should be published quite soon, Jane. And uh, <laughs> so big up to Jane. So that's the kind of publishing, different ways you can look at research, different ways you can publish without actually doing research. A lot of it is just sharing. You know, people worry, oh, I can't do that, I'm not clever enough, but share what you know with others. It may be helpful. Right, this is the last bit here. One of my things at the moment is to develop a nurse-led discharge tool. We've got a grant from the Burdett Trust. And this comes after Winterbourne View, where there was the abuse, criminal behavior of nurses, 
and others towards people with learning disabilities. But it also highlighted that many people were in hospital inappropriately. So this was really to make a transparent discharge, to put the person at the centre of their own discharge to be involved, but also to provide a system and structure for nurses, something where they can quantify their interventions so they can go to the person, well, we've done this, this and this, we have this progress, rather than kind of getting there, being asked and thinking, what did we do? So you have it all there. So this is out, hopefully, in the should have been out last week, but next week or the week after, and we've got a discharge. This will be free, and initially it will go on to Steve's site for people to download, and then the foundation site here at LSBU. We've got an easy read version. We've got a manual to show people how to do it and the reasons for asking certain questions. And we've also got a charter from a group called Mind Apples, who are a bit like the I'm Tuesday like group. That, yeah. You went to Mind Apples, yeah. didn't you? I think they're starting up again soon. Aren't yeah. They? Um, and this is what they did. And what we saw, although this was forensic and it came out of such a horrible incident, people were saying discharge horrible across the board. So we've developed a bit so it can be used in any setting. Right, contributing to the evidence base, there is Professor Nick Burris, who was one of the pioneers. Um, without him, I would not be here. He supervised my PhD. He got me onto my PhD. He drove me like a dog to do research. <laughs> but he's a great man. You know, he's the master of the red pen, and I still get... <laughs> I still get the family very upset because I've taken on his ways and <laughs> so I don't get much stuff around. And Jane, it's almost like, come on, bring that baton. Uh, we've worked together <laughs> kind of ever since. And without Jane, I wouldn't have developed how I've done. So contributing to the evidence base. Another one, Professor Andrew Forrester at Cardiff University. Where the kind of three constants in these two projects, the first one's Brixton Prison, and the other one's Camberwell Green Magistrates Court, which unfortunately closed. No, it's offending different in any of these groups. Well, <coughs> everyone commits the same type of crime. There's not really much difference in some of the figures we see. There's a lot of historical stuff which will kind of demonise people and say they're doing that, but there's not that much evidence. But it is different as well because, for instance, someone with a learning disability may lack planning. It may be less well executed. So there, easier to detect, easier to get caught. And these might be one of the reasons people are overrepresented. Range of possible consequences not thought out, whether to the victim, whether to themselves, what will happen? Make crime, horrible, horrible word, but that's so people might know. But it's about someone known to you, really, who's kind of bullying you. And also there's issues of people being victims, people taking people into their trust, confidence, cookering, people taking over people's houses. It's just the kind of the odd domestic dispute in a residential home is one thing, but... It goes to whole new levels, this stuff. Um, Behaviour might be minimised or normalised. Lyle, in 1995, his things, there was, he reported things like serious assaults on people, but they were never reported to the police. Why? Because they couldn't help it. These kind of old-fashioned paternalistic views which help nobody, really, with their independence. Execution and motives made different. And the criminal justice system has less sentencing op options. So Brixton Prison, around 800 prisoners. Um, we got 240, and uh, we got 87 with neurodevelopmental difficulties, and 153 without. Now, a big part of this was not to look at prevalence, but to look at what was the best approaches to screening identification, and look at some of the mental health profiles of this, these groups of people. So for the screening, we uh, I'll just leave them up there because I won't explain in detail each of the things. And those who screened positive 
went on and we did a, a fuller diagnostic test. So look at the mental health aspect. There's a tool called the MINI, um, which covers 22 diagnoses, and it gives you a good indication if somebody's got uh, a psychiatric disorder. Now, what we did find, which is probably the most interesting part of the slide, is that 49% who screened positive had not been previously recognised prior to prison. So, <coughs> out of quite a small study, it's quite a, a, big, a big finding. This slide, don't worry about the figures, but it's just to say, we know prisoners are usually disadvantaged, um, come from poorer backgrounds, but the group with neurodevelopmental difficulties were more likely not to be in a relationship, more likely to be homeless, more likely not to be unemployment or study, unable to read or write. So they had, in terms of quality of life, theirs was less so. Now, this is looking at self-harm. Now, for all of those who like numbers, you'll see 69 versus 69. And you thought, you told me you had 240. Well, I did. <laughs> but we only had 69 with mental health data. If you work in a prison, you go the next day to find that person to re-interview them, they're not there. So the 69 people were the people who had full data sets on. And the other 69, we kind of match the controls. But this shows you within the prison, what we were finding was much larger, proportionately, um, this kind of self-harm. And this is kind of reporting self-harm. Although actual self-harm, the other group got more. In terms of mental health problems, again, we're looking at higher rates of psychosis, affective disorders, um, really a, across the board. And, and this will differ, and this is why I use these figures with caution, because it's not a it is not prevalence, it's just how many people in this prison are there. It's the other information we're looking around the numbers, rather than the actual numbers. So don't go around and say, there was that many percent, or this. Leave that for others. So... That was a flavour of the Brixton, Camberwell Court. Wow. <laughs> we actually developed a service. Um, we had a specialist psychiatrist, psychologist, forensic mental health practitioner, a learning disability nurse, and this complemented the mental health liaison diversion service running along. And as we finished the project, I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you later, but <laughs> the upset. But... We collected baseline data for a couple of years, um, and that was really from the stats, the me mental health minimum data set. Um, out of the 20,000 that appeared during the time, around about 829 were actually referred to liaison and diversion services. Now, why this study? Well, traditionally, liaison and diversion services have primarily focused on major mental illness. They're set up for all vulnerabilities, but this is the comfort zone of L&D, whether it's in police, court, or whatever the setting. A lack of awareness and identification of people within L&D means this group not only get missed, but it limits their participation in proceedings. It limits their rights. It limits their understanding. Also, how people present, how people act, is often misinterpreted as perhaps being aloof, belligerent, all of these things, just because people lack a little bit of awareness and make instant judgments. We know that this group, or it's reported that increased risk of reoffending, police contact, and more restrictive sentences, and they're also at increased risk of poorer mental and physical health. <coughs> and this you'll see the rates of identified um, mental disorder in this. As you can see here, it's the other group with higher figures. And this is why I always tell you, with caution, but this is what we found. Is it because this is more sophisticated? Is it because we were late to the party in identifying people? Don't know. We're still kind of looking at that stuff. But depression was the big one. Depressive disorders or mood disorders were bigger in our, our group there. 
why we've got the verses was that was before we looked at the figures before and then after so before the service started and then after in each of them what we found in terms of neurodegenerative conditions I'll give you a number 9.5 percent both phases so we didn't identify any more we put in a process but what we did find was the people that we did identify were most, less, most likely to have just a single disorder. There was much more comorbidity. So, for example, learning disabilities or autism, much more before. But having the specialist staff, it was like, this, this is what, what it is and this is what's going. And that has major implications because perhaps if you miss ADHD, for example, and medication, stimulant medication is required. Well, and you're doing something else, you've missed an opportunity. Whatever you're doing, you can do the wrong bit. Just because they share the same conditions, people aren't treated the same. Interventions aren't the same. Um, so, what we thought, are these figures representative? And the bad news was Camberwell caught shut just after we finished. <laughs> So <laughs> we couldn't do much more there. So we looked at five courts in London, 9,088 people, 80% were men roughly, 20% women. What we found here, because we had bigger numbers to play with, that there were significantly higher rates of schizophrenia in black defendants, whereas white defendants were more likely to have, be depressed or have a personality disorder. Um, around a fifth reported suicide, self-harm. Um, and what we found was this mixed race. We don't often hear much about this group of people. They usually lumped in one group or another group. But that group, mixed race, mixed heritage, whatever, whoever people have defined themselves on that census, were the most likely. Right, so we looked bigger then. Jane has a bright idea. Now look, let's look around the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> Australia, Norway. And we looked at what the courts are like there. And we had the privilege of Eric Sondanar, who's great chap. And Susan Hayes, who's one of the pioneers of screening in Australia. I mean, I'm reading her before screening's a thing, you know, so if anyone wants to look at the Hazzy and all that stuff, but yeah, so it was a great to work with those people. And we just kind of compared our practice differs between countries. So two of the places had screening in place. We found all the places had support for vulnerable dependents. Where the big issue was is what's the disposal options? Where do people go? Is it mandatory care? Is it prison? Is it this? So that was the way of kind of expanding it to the next level. So what do we do next? We try to develop a, a consensus of opinion around. So we had a House of Lords consensus meeting. We was invited by Lord Bradley to hold. And most of you in the field would know that with the famous Bradley report in 2009 <coughs> in criminal justice system. And we had 22 experts. It was COVID, so it was Zoom. So we didn't get the posh sandwiches. It was just the swearing, don't bring that in now, I'm on a Zoom. <laughs> you know. So I'd love to say oh, that we had a day out, but we didn't. Psychiatry, psychology, nursing, judges. And we kind of looked at the themes to take forward. What's the next stages? So the first is remembering the experiences of individuals and also their differences, whether it's gender, ethnicity, and also acknowledging that our group, the group of people with learning disability and neuro neurodevelopmental conditions, suffer the same systemic disadvantage. The only difference is, is they have people from all of the other groups. So if any of you, <laughs> whether it's campaigning for racial equality, gay rights, whatever it is, you've got anyone with a learned disability, everyone's welcome at our door. So, you know, um, and you will say that, won't you, Pete? 
So that was a bit. So the second degree theme was this screening example. We showed you those screening tools. In the court, we used a different one called the RAPID, which was developed by one of our researchers. But there's no common agreement. There's also no agreement where you screen. What's the use screen? And what do you do if you get a positive screen? And also, do you have time to screen? What you do to get is a screen when people come in from prisons or the outside. You have a forensic mental health practitioner who looks at people who are vulnerable, regardless of the condition. The third bit <coughs> was what is the service model? What should they look like? Should it be us with separate teams? Should you have a regional model where you go to different courts and support people? It's still out there. And this one is still on the agenda. And Professor Flood up there has promised me we'll, we'll do an economic evaluation. And <laughs> we're going to get that together. Because I think it's still striking why that iron's hot. Right, last bit for all those who want to drink. <laughs> <laughs> Working together, collaboration. There's Peter. He's actually presenting. It's not karaoke night, was it, Pete? No. Well, it was on a Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Maggie, who's a travel buddy. Steve again. And Ruwani, who's the latest iteration of the Estia Centre. So there's four generations of us, and we still kind of keep it. And I think that's the good thing about having similar values keeping working, not being precious where you are. It's working for the good. Right, <laughs> answers ladder of participation. This is one of the most plagiarized ladders in the world. And you get it for co-production as well. And co-production, a lot of them I've read, it's just like, we're in the same room as the other group. No, 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 the other group are leading by the end of it. The other group have grown. The other group are supporting you you've got some mutual bit. Now, is young Peter up there for the Tuesday group, yeah? There's Liam, um, Yolanda, um, God, who's the other two, Steve? Uh, Anne. Anne and Becky? No. no. Uh, All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you cut that one out, we don't want any safeguarding alerts. <laughs> no, yeah. It's like, <laughs> you move on. Yvonne. 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 Now, Peter, way before I, not Peter, Steve, way before I got into this, supported Peter, Liam and Yolanda yes. to write an article in the Advances Journal about their experiences of good mental health. We went on to the books. Yes. Yeah. We're doing another copy soon as well, another copy. That's right, and I'll get onto that in a minute, mate. Yeah. So here's Pete again with Liam. It's Christine Burke from the Foundation for People with Learning Disabilities. It's Peter and his better half, Sandra, who's sitting with us today. And this is at an awards ceremony. We've had quite a few awards ceremonies, but won nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And it's quite I'll special. tell you what, this chap here, Lloyd Page, you'll see him all over the place, men cat. <laughs> Lloyd is kind of a renter crowd, isn't he? <laughs> but Lloyd wins awards, yeah, so yeah. we've recruited him. Yeah. We, who knows? <laughs> yeah, it's like, and what do you do? Anyway, yeah, it? yeah, we're sitting there like, oh, no. yeah. I can't say that because, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, there we are. Books. Feeling Down, Foundation People Learn Disabilities. Resources about free to download again, about people, how to help their own mental health, coping strategies. Guided self-help. This came out of my PhD. What we did was manualise the approach for people with learning disabilities. The difference with this manual, though, is people like Peter and Liam are also authors and wrote their bit in it. You rarely get manuals where the people you're targeting have inputted into it. So, I'm proud of these for different reasons. The next one was COVID. Um, and Pete, you won't mind me saying, no. um, during COVID, Pete was having a, a terrible time. He talked to Steve, and your issue was, am I going to wake up alive? Mm. A real, a real thing. So, 
Peter and Steve, come and see me. And we started to look at other people's stories, to let people make sense, to share stuff. So we did that. And then this year, we've done the second book um, on Peter and Friends. It's the series are called Peter and Friends. We publish it ourselves. We do all the stuff ourselves. We call it Penge Publishing because we meet in the, the bar at the back of my house. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we all cut. We're, it's a kind of a motley crew. It's a good bar as well, it's isn't it? A, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's a motley crew. So... The thing with this one, Peter started this, but by this time, we've increased the number of people with learning disabilities who are actually editing, taking part actively. So Sandra joined us, Lloyd joined us, and for the next one, where with the Foundation People Learn Disabilities, we're going to look to include more people. So for the first time, there's going to be more people with learning disabilities who have direct input. And a kind of spoiler, some of the titles we're thinking about it's why people treat us differently, hate crime, areas around this area. But the other thing about this, I must say, is that inside the book, you can download these free, and I can give anyone the links, or Steve, because they're from his site. They're written by people with learning disabilities, the views of their carers, supporters, clinicians, writing about the areas that we're talking about. There's also easy reads for people who learn disabilities in it. Sections can pick it up and look at it. So it's contribution for the whole community rather than just one group and saying, look at us, we've done this. And so these, although very stressful because we only have ourselves to support, <laughs> um, are quite rewarding once they're done. So the objective is you from five people? Yeah, that's next, Steve. Oh, <laughs> oh stop. Stealing my thunder. God. It's my day, Steve. <laughs> right. We had contribution from five continents. <laughs> yeah. We had Canada, Australia, Malaysia, South Africa, Ghana, Spain, Netherlands. Is it Austria, Germany? Austria. Austria. All of these people with learning disabilities told us about their experiences. Up here is Madrid. Our Medina, these are a group of people with learning disabilities who won a contract to deliver postal services. Where do you hear about stuff like that? And this is kind of inspirational when people are looking at, well, what do people in the rest of the world do? You know, rather than just looking in their own front room. This is Michael from South Africa. He's on his arms, he's got, I want a future. This bloke, as well as being terrified of COVID, was also worried about getting shot by the local gangs in South Africa. And it's like, that kind of shows you the differences in lives and why it's kind of so, so rich. The final bit is, the latest launch, there's myself and Peter interviewing Vince, who gave a really honest open, he's in the book as well, talking about his thoughts of self-harm, etc. Right, last slide. Um, foundation people learn disabilities. Well, um, we do more work with them because um, having introduced them to London South Bank, um, Christine left for health reasons, so I'm now director of that, <laughs> and hopefully you'll be hearing a bit more about it soon. And the other one is the AMID, which we started, and it's been going here since around 2007, and other people in the audience um, before that. And it's a kind of collaboration of multidisciplinary European groups sharing practice and extending practice. When we started, I remember going to Zagreb, there was talk about people in cocktails. There was all sorts of stuff happening. Now, the gap is getting less. It's just the kind of services and the regional variations. This is where we're in Bucharest, where we kind of had a campaign around Eastern Europe, really just kind of spreading the message around. But, well, I think that's me, but 
Thank you, everybody. I haven't got a clue what the time is, if I've overrun or not, but thanks.